to stay right here for a moment. Just soak it. His presence is never too far away. And y'all, we need to be reminded of what His presence feels like. When He is here, sometimes we get so busy that we're not even aware.
song that just, I believe, came at the perfect timing. It's called the refiner. And I just want to remind you that God is the refiner. brings us to a pure state. We allow him to chip us away, to bring us to a state that is pure and holy. Let me just read what God has just been showing me. The Bible often uses imagery of gold being refined as a picture of what God does in our lives. Gold, when extracted from the earth, does not look like gold. Hmm. It's not what we find in a jewelry store. In fact, it is not always recognizable due to the impurities that are marked in its appearance. Yet for the person surging for it, the ugliest lump of gold is what they're looking for. That lump of gold has great value. The potential for its beauty is evident. And we as men and women are similar to those lumps of unrefined gold. You know, the gold goes through a refining process. I want to look it up. It says the refining process is hot. To refine gold, heat must be applied to force the impurities to the surface. And as the impurities rise, they are removed and more heat is applies, applied. The process continues and continues over and over and over. The heat is reapplied and applied and reapplied until the gold is pure. Now listen to this. The refiner knows the gold is pure when he looks into the gold and sees his clear reflection. Earlier, I said, it's just like you and I. Doesn't he bring us through the fire? Doesn't he press us? Doesn't he make us uncomfortable? Doesn't he chip us away and make us do things, Amanda, that we don't want to do? He's bringing us through the process. What is that process? To when we meet him face to face and he sees his clear reflection through us. He looks in us and he sees himself. Whew. I don't know about you, but I want to go through the fire. Is it scary? Yes. Is it hot? But I know what God has called me to do this year, and it's not going to be easy. Am I scared? Yes, I am scared. But I want to be in a position where God is going to use me, where God is going to see an obedience and a willing vessel. Are you ready? Y'all, for our church to go to the next place, Brother Packy, we have to be ready as a team. We're going to sing this song. I want it to resonate with you.
Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, if that's a prayer that you have tonight, you need to understand. That's why things, it don't start till it heats up. Your life, your family, your, your situation. You know, there's things that we have to straighten up. Things that have to come out of us. There are things as we process through our growth in God, the only way some things come out is through the deep fire. And I'm going to tell you, when you start praying that kind of prayer and start asking God to do whatever it takes to get you to a pure place, you know, you are, you're inviting the anointing and the power of a holy God into your life. But in doing so, you're releasing something that only God can release. So when you pray that, we sing that, but do you mean that? So when you begin to cry out to God, God, I want to serve you no matter what. What has to come out of your life for that to happen? What has to change inside of you for that to happen? What do you have to let go of so that God can do what he promised you? There's a process. I'm going to tell you something. Going through the fire is miserable and glorious at the same time as God is showing us the things that need to be, be loosed and showing us what we can be I love that that he knows it's right when he can see his reflection in the, in the gold when God can look down and see himself looking back y'all that's when we, we've gotten to a place where he can begin to use us where we can be pure in his sight that, that, takes a, that takes a process. Each of us has to willingly enter the keel. They call it a, a keel. A keel. Because you got to die in that. It kills the old and looses the new. But I'm going to tell you something. Until you are willing to get into that and go through that you will never be what God wants you to be you will, you, will, you will always be short of what your heart's desire is hallelujah hallelujah won't y'all go ahead and be seated James the second chapter you can go ahead and turn there we're gonna we're gonna get ready to to, to give what God gave for me for tonight. It's understanding that nothing happens until your faith receives legs. Nothing happens in the church until faith is released through someone to do what God wants them to do. There's a, there's a process that everything that we are going to do in, in the kingdom of God has to first be spoken from God into you, then out of you into the world, and then there has to be actions that follow the statement. Do you understand that you cannot of your own self will some great work? God always speaks into us. He always gives us something that he wants us to trust him with to speak it out and then walk it out. There's never a time when, when God is, is slack concerning what he's wanting to do, but how often does God pour into us a direction? He gives us a word and we hold it back and refuse to do anything with it. And so, or we're waiting on God to do some great thing to open some door before we'll start to walk. And it just doesn't work that way. James 2.14 says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister being naked and destitute of food and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace and be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what did it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not worked, is dead, being alone. Father, I ask that you would touch the heart of your people here today. And I ask that, Lord God, you would draw us into that place that we would realize that, Lord God, you are stirring in us to do more than think, to do more than pray, to do more than watch. God, you are calling us to do, to obey, to follow, to carry through. That, Lord God, you want our works to line up to our faith. That, Lord God, our faith not be dead but alive. I ask that you would reveal to us in Jesus' name 
where we are. Amen. So when I begin to to put together the message and thinking about about the message and the day and where we are, I begin to to look at and think about the the way God does things in the future and the past and and the direction. Uh, How many of y'all were a part of the church when we built this church? 17 years ago, right, we built this church. How many of y'all were, were not born 17 years ago? Okay. How many of y'all were there when they built the other, the, the brick church that was on the old property? Let me see your hands. Now that was, see, 27 years, 18 years. That What's that, 30? 35 years ago. 45 years ago, sorry, thank you. My math sometimes. 45 years ago. Who was not born 45 years ago? Okay. Oh, come on, Joe. I'm sorry. 49 years ago. Who was alive when they built the old white building that's on the property that was there? Go ahead, Rich. Write your hand. Right. <laughs> how many years ago was that? Who, how, do you remember when that building was built? Well, we know that, the, that it was the first build, and they met in a barn before that. None of y'all were in the barn. I have pictures. Now, but I want you to think about the years that have passed in the ministry that I remember when we came to Bayou Blue. Uh, 20, how, Michelle, how old are you? Where'd she go? She stepped out. How old is Michelle? 28. So when I moved here, she was one years old. When Sister Jan and I moved to, to Bayou Blue, she was one years old. She wasn't coming to the church. They had left or going somewhere else, but they came back. So now you see the place that she is in leadership 27 years ago. How many of you here, uh, you're, you're, you're five years old, six years old or older? I want you to begin to think about as we're moving forward, getting ready to build the next phase of who we are, that in, in 18 years, in 17 years, what will you be doing? Where will your life be? What will your ministry be? What will God begin to do? See, I, I understand that as we, as we plan for the future, we have to plan not with what we have today, but what we're wanting to have then. Are we going to raise up a generation that's going to be able to take what we believe in, what we're doing, and move it to the next level? Are we going to be able to raise a church full of Pentecostal, Holy Ghost-filled people who are willing to take a stand against the world and the things in the world who's not going to be moved or motivated by the, by the money or by the popularity or by the power that this world presents to them? Are we going to raise a generation that is going to sell its talents and its abilities to the world? world because it wants to be popular or are we going to raise a holy people i want to raise a holy people i want to raise a generation that that in the next 20 years is going to be able to take the positions that all of our leadership holds today and they're going to be able to take us to another level of leadership that we can't bring ourselves into but can i tell you the whole process begins by taking steps of faith now, the question was asked in, the, in, in, in verse 14, what does it profit, my brother, who says he has faith and has not worked, can faith save him? Now, he answers the question as it goes down, right? He says, what profit is, what good does it do if you see somebody in need and say to them, be warmed and filled, but you don't meet the need that's there? He said, even so, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead. So he's, in other words, he's saying your faith, your statement of belief alone cannot save you. There has to be works that are following you, works that are coming up in your life that line up to what you said you believe. If we say that we believe that Jesus Christ is the only way, the only hope, the only how, then are we living our lives out to, to show that that's what we believe? So when I begin to, to talk about stepping into ministry and doing what God's called us to do, you have to check yourself and look and ask yourself, am I listening to what God has spoken to my heart? Am I doing what God called me to do when he called me? Am I following through with that word that Jesus gave me? 
Now we can look into the Old Testament and, and I want us to kind of look at some of the things because I want us to realize that just talking about ministry is not enough. Just talking about how cool it would be to do this work isn't good enough. Talking about reaching a world with the gospel is not enough. Just knowing that there's a need out there, it doesn't take a genius to know the world needs help. All you got to do is look out there. People are dying and people are falling apart. They need help. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we see in the Word of God there are there were men of God that were used. Elisha was one that God used in a mighty way. Elisha was a man that stood separate from all the other prophets of God at his time, and he stood up against Ahab, this evil king that had conquered so much and had done so much. Uh, Jezebel, his wife, had come in, and they were they were persecuting God's people. They were destroying all of those that were worshiping the true and only God in the Elisha spoke a word, and he spoke a word against him, but he spoke a word that God gave to him. God told him, I want you to pray. Tell him it's not going to rain until you say it's going to rain again. And so he got up and spoke that. But after he had spoken that, then God said, I want you to go and wait in this place. I want you to understand something, that, that when God gives us instruction and we step out, and then he gives us further instruction, we must follow through with the word God's given us. Elijah could have not gone to the brook. He could have said, you know, I don't want to go there. I want to be somewhere else. Over there, there's, you know, the people may find me. God, I want to go do this. And there's a lot of times when God says, I want you to step up and be this person. I want you to be this man or this woman. I want you to, to reach out and touch hurting, homeless, de devastated people. I want you to meet this need. And we say, God, I would do that if I had. More ability. If I had more of a reach, if I had more money, if I had more resources. But God, I can't do that. I don't have enough. And so we begin to see when Elijah told God, okay, God brought him to this brook and he drank from the water, but he didn't have food. So what did God do? God sent ravens with me to drop it off to him so he'd have something to eat. Now, can I tell you that is a miracle that God did, but had he not been where he was supposed to be, he wouldn't have had meat to eat. How often does God tell us, I want you to go and do, and we don't want to go, and so we stay where we are, and then we complain because there ain't nothing to eat. We complain because the strength that God was going to give us isn't there. We complain because we thought surely God would move and do this, but God's not going to move and do what you want him to do until you've been obedient to what he's called you to do. That's the process of trusting God. It's not enough to say, I trust you, God. Are you stepping out? Are you doing what God's called you to do? Have you made a decision that you're going to begin even though you don't know how? You remember this, Elaine, when you came to me and said, I believe that God wants me to feed hungry people. She knew how what it was to have hungry people. I mean, Job, she raised him. <laughs> He's a hungry people. She understood what it was. To, to, she said, I don't know what else I can do, but I know I can feed people. I know I can do that, Pastor, and, and I feel like there's a need that we need to feel in our community and in our area. And so we said, I told her, I said, Lord, what? go ahead and begin. I, I was uh, behind her 100%, but she drew a team together. She began to formulate a way. God opened up a door with the churches in our area that we were able to purchase a building. We were able to go there and, and feed people. And, and there is an ongoing ministry that's been there for, what, 17, 18 years? 17 years where we've been feeding people every week in some, some churches, they're feeding people. But that began because it was put inside of someone's heart who said, I'll do it, God. Got up and spoke. And they came to me with the desire to do that before we ever thought about starting a feeding ministry downtown. Before they ever thought about going to New Orleans and bringing food and bringing supplies, before it ever crossed their mind to do that, God spoke to them about feeding people right here. Just start a pantry and give food to people when they need it. It didn't start out as a ministry that's going to go into New Orleans and bring food and, and supplies and, and bring socks and help people out. It didn't start that way. The ministry started out, would you just do one thing for me? And as we do that one thing for God, as we're obedient in the little things, God begins to bring more things. 
That's what God does. It's the process of doing that that opens up those doors. You know, we think about when T and Stephanie share their testimony and, and they talk about, you know, people say, well, they have this bus, they, they drive buses and, and vans and they go to the schools. It didn't start out that way. That wasn't what happened. What happened was that they had a cousin who didn't have a ride and they said, well, you can ride with us. We'll bring you to church. We'd be glad to do that. And that was a burden as they saw more kids on the side of the road who didn't have a ride. They didn't have a way to church. They began to say, well, you know what? We can bring more and we'll get us a van and we'll bring more. And, and then they said, Pastor, we, we just, we need a bus. I said, good night. How many people live on your street? Turns out they were driving down other people's streets. They were looking for something, some way to do. God put a burden in their heart to pick up kids and bring them to church. They never thought about teaching. They never thought about, about going and doing lessons. All they wanted to do was go pick up kids and bring them to church. But see, because they were faithful to do that, and they came and said, Pastor, we really want to get a, a bus. And the board and I looked at them, and we, we believed in them and had faith in them, and we purchased that first bus for like 600 bucks. We did. We loaned it to another church, and they did $2,000 worth of damage to the brakes. <laughs> you got to love your brother. And then they didn't offer to fix it. So we bought the next bus we bought was a little bit more expensive. Then we got them a bus with, with fan, uh, air conditioner on it. But they, they right now they got two buses, they got two vans. But now their ministry that started just picking up kids because they, they began to, to be faithful to God. They began to step out and begin to say, you know, Pastor, this door's open and we're not sure, but we think we can do this. What do you think? And I said, hey, if God's put it in your heart, go do it. They began to go and eat lunch. They began to go then and do Christian clubs. And now they're in schools almost every day reaching kids and speaking God over them. Why? Because they, they trusted God to pick up the one kid. And trust God in that, that God has opened up so much more. I think about our kids' ministry and where we are today. I remember the very first kids' ministry. It was on Mother's Day. How many of y'all were there when we started our very first kids' church? Some of y'all was in kids' ministry, huh? Y'all remember I was a kid in kids' church, some of y'all. Some of y'all wasn't born yet. I can't remember how many years ago that was. Wow. A long time ago, Trey was just a kid. Josh wasn't born. And we started a kids' ministry. We didn't know what it was going to look like. None of our leaders in kids' church had been kids' pastors or kids' leaders. They taught Sunday school, and, and they, they, they worked. I think Connie and them worked with the youth. Joe and Chris had worked with the youth. I know Miss Talisa had worked. In ministry, I don't know if, if she had worked in kids ministry specifically, but, but we had this ministry going on and we just began to meet. And they said, Pastor, we just want to do this. And it's, can we order a, a box of material? I can't remember what they called it. No, I, it, was a, it was something. It was a, it was a, 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 I knew it was toolbox something. Yeah. I knew it was curriculum. And, and I remember they started looking at it, making copies of it. They got their team together. And I'm going to tell you something. We never started out thinking that we would be able to train kids and, and get them to, to go to nationals in, in uh, you know, wherever the Assemblies of God meet and, and compete. We actually have one of our students win nationals in music. We've had our kids score in the top percent of all the kids in all the United States in the different ministry. We, we be, I mean, we've been right there because we had people who began to believe that God was able to do something on Bayou Blue to move and to minister. But it wasn't until we began to put feet to our faith, it was when Elijah called out King Ahab and said, I want you to get all your prophets and get them up on the mountain because we're going to have an offering under the real true God. Won't you get them all up there? And all the prophets of Baal, all the prophets of the groves, they bowed together up on that mountain. They built them an altar. They laid their sacrifice on the altar and they began to cry out to Baal to send fire so they could prove he was God. They jumped on the 
the altar, cut themselves, did all this work. And Elijah, Elijah was standing there saying, you know, God, here I am. Now, I didn't put myself out here. If something happens, what am I going to do? Is everybody against me? But he put himself out there and he prayed and God sent fire and consumed the altar. But that wasn't the greatest part of the miracle. Then he fell on his knees and began to pray. God said, pray for rain. And he got on his knees and he began to pray. He prayed for rain. God, send the rain. And, and he sent his servant, go look. Go look and see. Oh, I'm sure that by now the, the rain's coming. And he came back and said, oh, no, sir, there, there's nothing. It's just empty. He said, go back and look again. Go Go back and look again. I'm going to tell you, I believe that God is looking for somebody who won't give up because it didn't happen the first day, the first how, the first why. But somebody that kept saying, you go back and look. You go back and look. I know I heard from God. I know that what I heard was from God. Go back and look. And finally, the seventh time he came back and he said, I saw a cloud about the size of a man's hand. He said, praise God, get up off the mountain, the rain's coming. You talk about faith, huh? I mean, we need to see lightning flashing first, Jesus. I ain't going to get, I mean, a little bit of cloud like that, it can't drop much. But Elisha knew that God had given him a word. Y'all, there's the difference. The difference because he stepped out on that mountain and risked his life by exposing himself to Ahab and to all these prophets. He put himself out there. He didn't just go around talking about, I'm the great prophet of God. He, he stepped out and exposed himself and said, okay, God, I'm here. I'm obeying you. I'm going to trust you. Y'all, that's what ministry is. Ministry is taking a step of faith and trusting God. That's what we do in our lives. Husbands and wives, you get married and, and you make vows at an altar. What do your vows look like? God, I, 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 you know, we make a, a promise to honor, to love, to keep sickness and health, good times and bad times, rich or poor. We pray and we make this commitment to each other that we're going to do this and we don't have a clue what we're talking about. Nobody getting married at 17, 18 years old understands what it's going to take to get 50 years under their belt. Yeah, but they did. When I said, when you first get married, you say all those things, but you don't know what sickness is going to look like. You don't know how bad things can get. You make that vow, but if you trust, then you get through it. If you hold on to those vows and you remember, I'm not letting go. I made a vow before God. And you know what? Just because times are tough, I ain't quitting. I ain't letting go. Well, y'all, that's the same kind of faith I'm talking about in the kingdom of God. Yeah, there are times when God has called us into direction and we say, okay, this is where God called me to be. And God says, no, I called you here. You just assume this. But it ain't all going to be like that. I, I, I've shared with y'all that, that I surrendered my life to ministry to be an evangelist. I told God I'll be an evangelist, but I won't be a pastor. I thought we had that strike between us. You know, I went to Bible college. They said, what is your ministry calling? I put evangelist. I am the evangelist. My daddy had a ministry, Patrick Thompson Evangelistic Ministry. Evangelist, not pastoral. And I told God, hey, I'll be an evangelist. I'll go out and reach. I preached in a tent. Sister Janet and I, we're, we're trusting God. We're believing God. And, and I'm working offshore, and she's young. We got married. She was 17, and, and I was a little older. And y'all don't be hating on me. And, and I went back offshore. She was able to... To, to grow up a little bit and, and enjoy life a little bit. And, and I told her one day, I said, I believe God wants me to leave my job and go full-time in ministry. And she just looked at me and said, well, you know, I'm fine with that. I just need God to tell me. Well, but we got to that. It was, it, was, it was months later that I said, you know, I just really believe it's God. She said, I tell you what, if they stack your rig, We'll know it's God. Well, she, we had just found out they had two years of work contracted signed. She felt really good about herself. <laughs> the following week, 
They called the house, said, look, we had to stack the rig because the location's not ready. But we'll put you on another rig so you don't have to miss a minute's work. How do you interpret that, right? I mean, the rig stack, but they're not laying me off. But the, the fleece was not that you won't get laid off. It's that they will stack your rig. And so I told, I told the boss on the phone, I said, no, sir, thank you. Why don't you have one of those other guys call them because if they miss a week's work, they're going to lose everything. But God's going to take care of me. I'm going to begin to minister full time. I'm going to be a preacher. And it got quiet. He said, are you sure, Packy? I said, absolutely. He said, if you ever need a job, call us. You got one. Thank you. And we stepped into our full, first full-time ministry preaching in a tent. Woo, come on, somebody. I was a full-time tent preacher in August in Louisiana. I don't know if y'all know this, but they don't, they don't come with air conditions in old tents. They do now. They didn't then. But I'm telling you, we stepped out and, and we said, okay, God, and I didn't ask my mom and dad, will y'all give me more money if I do this? I, they told me what they were going to pay us. And we agreed to it. And then, right after we said yes to that, I get a phone call from a church. Hey, we want you to come be our pastor. I looked at my wife and I thought, you got to be kidding me. But I already knew God told me to take the other position. The church paid a salary and had a parsonage and people. <laughs> the tent had a tent and a pole <laughs> and a crank. And it was tough. But I knew it was all we did anyway. Stepping into that, we had to believe. Did God call us into ministry? Can I tell you that I want, we wound up in Eunice, Louisiana for three years. We left there because we know God said it's time to let go. God said, I want you to pastor. And I said, God, wait a minute. We had a deal. I'm going to get to be an evangelist. When I went to Eunice, they hired me as an outreach evangelism director. I wasn't going to go. They gave me that title. Everything I did, it was pastoral. But we got home, and I remember I'm sitting there, I'm struggling. You know, you make a decision, you're going to step out and do what God wants you to do. And, and we always say, oh, it's great men and great women of faith. I, I'm, from November the 23rd, 24th, 23rd, we moved from Eunice back to Gina. January the 10th was the first Sunday I preached here. The 17th, they elected me pastor. So from November the 23rd, 24th, till January the 10th, that's not but about a month and a half. About right before Christmas, I'm in my room crying because I don't have any money to buy my, my wife and my kids good presents. Now, if I'd have had money, I still wouldn't have wanted to, but I, you know, at least I'd have had money to not do it. No, I at least, I at least want to have to make the choice. I don't want to buy it rather than I can't buy it. I remember I was praying, I was crying, I said, God, I'll go back. If, if I missed you, if I stepped out of Eunice and it wasn't time, and I was just my pride, whatever it was, I will go back and I will repent before the pastor and I will beg him to let me come home to there. And God said, I called you. But I didn't know where. But I knew that I was called, and I, I'm stepping out, and so what did I do? I began to send resumes to churches. I wasn't going to do that. I was going to wait for God to give me a specific church and tell me where to go, and he didn't. And my daddy said, well, why won't you send your resume? I said, well, God can just send me a name. He said, yeah, but until you step into a property, you'll never know if that's where God wants you or not. Until you step out of your comfort zone and go down and you begin to look and listen and hear, you'll never know. You know, we see that when a lie show was, 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 was prophet over Israel, that uh, uh, Naaman the leper came down. He said, go dip yourself in the water seven times. Now, there's a process sometimes you have to go through. Did God call you to something? you got to begin to put feet to that. The man had to go down there, crawl into the water, and begin to dip himself 
seven times. Not five, not four, not six, but seven. What did God speak to your heart? Has God put something in your heart to be, something in your heart to do? What are you doing about it? Are you allowing yourself to just sit back and you're waiting on God to do something else? I mean, he's already given you a word. He's already laid something in your heart. He's already said for you, hey, this is what you ought to do. But are you sitting back looking at that wondering, is should I do more or should I sit back? Should I wait on God or should I just get out there and begin to do stuff? See, we get confused with being busy about what God called us to do with just being busy. When God puts something in your heart to do, you need to be about doing that. When God called me to, to reach the world with the gospel, I didn't have a platform of which to do that at the time. So what did I do? I began to make myself busy doing what God wanted me to do. I began to prepare myself. I went to Bible college, and then I began to do Bible studies. I began to minister and to preach to the people who were around me. Can I tell you, if you're not reaching the people in your Jerusalem, you're not going to reach the people in Judea. You're not going to reach the people in Samaria. You're not going to reach the people on the other side of the earth. If you're not willing to do what God called you to do right where you are, God's not going to send you to do it somewhere else. Not going to do it. You have to make a decision. You have to make a decision whether you're going to be obedient, whether your faith is going to be more than just, oh, I see a need, God. Fill it. Or God, here I am. Send me. Yeah, there's, a, there's a shifting in thought, and, and I love what Sister Jan is talking about, a shifting in, in, in the atmosphere over our church and over our ministries, because I believe that God's setting us to the next gear. I believe we're about to hit another gear and take us to another place. I believe that. I believe that God has put pieces in place. He's lining things up, getting us ready to be able to take that step, to say within ourselves, I am going to do this because I believe God called me to it. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm not going to ask everybody else to do it for me, but I'm going to step into the place and I'm going to begin to do what God wants me to do, whatever it takes. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be there. I'm going to do that. I spoke this morning, but this scripture was for tonight, James 1, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. If, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholds himself and goeth his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. So do you want to be blessed in your deeds? So you got to begin to say, what did God speak to you? Think about that. It may be an old word deep inside. Think about it, Jonathan. An old word deep inside. A lot of times we bury those up and say, I was just, I was young. That word came, but how, I mean, come on. That kind of crazy, you know, them, them, you know how them old prophets and old, old, they used to be crazy people. They give them crazy words to people. I'm just a little kid, you're going to speak all that over me. Think about, I want you to think about it. Think about that word. I, I was told that I would be a peacemaker. Yeah, it's still hard for people to accept that. But you know what? God uses me to help people get through struggles. In our district, he sends people to me. He, I get phone calls from people. Pastor, what should I do? And God's given me the ability to speak peace into people's lives. I'd have never thought it, but God gave that word so long ago. God gave a word that, that I was going to be like Peter. I thought, I'm going to cut somebody's ear off. You know, no, God was going to make me a rock and movable. A personality that's not easily moved. I'm going to tell you something, when I make my mind up, you ain't knocking me off my rock. That's, that's good, though. You don't need to be, be easily swayed. We don't need to be like a person who is swayed by every wind of doctrine. A wave that goes back and forth. You need to know what you believe and you need to stand on it. God put that in me that when I believe and I know that God has spoke to me, I won't back off of it. I won't, I won't give it up. I'm going to believe what God wants me to do and I'm going to fight through it. Why? Because God, but God, he spoke that over me way before it ever came to pass. God begins to stir inside of us as he's drawing us into those places. What did God say to you, Caleb? 
so long ago. What did he say? What word did God give us about us? What words were spoken over? They may seem ridiculous at the moment. They may seem ridiculous now. But there's a word that God gives us. That is a word of a seed that begins to go deep inside of us. And as the old man dies, that seed takes root inside of us. And that thing that God spoke over us begins to override the thing that we were until it eats away all the old and leaves the new. And the new nature that is in Christ Jesus begins to take over who I am. But it comes from that word. What did God say to you? What word did God give you? Don't hide it forever. Hide it for a season. Let it take root. But it's got to be remembered. You've got to speak it out over you. God, I know that I'm meant for so much more than this. When that burns in your heart, You can know you are, not because of you, not because you're all that, but because God's got a calling and a purpose. And y'all, we're not there yet. We've not come to the end of what God wants for us. We're still traveling to that place for me. But what about the next generation? We know what, what about Matthew and Tyree? What about their generation? What is God speaking to them? What is the future going to look like to them? When I look across the congregation and I see some of our adult leadership, but I remember when they were kids. Some of y'all remember when y'all were young. (laughs) I'm with y'all. We're moving forward, but, but I see the group that's coming up. I see our young people, and I remember when they were born. And now they got kids. But I remember the words of God. I remember the moments when things happened. I I, I think about what they must have thought, Sister Janet, when my mom and dad heard me preach for the first time. What they must have been thinking. Oh my God. Who would have ever thought that Packy I'm telling you, I was the worst kid they had. It's the truth. I'm not bragging. I'm telling you, I was the ADHD of my day. I was. I sat there and I couldn't I couldn't be be held down, but I'd leave church and I remembered everything they talked about. My brain worked that way, still does. I can I can be in one conversation and listen to what you're saying about me. Be careful. I have that ability, it's that anointing, I can do that. But what is God, the word that God's speaking to us, what is that word? God called me to reach the world and I've not done it yet. I don't believe, Sister Connie, that I will ever accomplish what God's put on my heart in my lifetime. I don't believe it. That's how come I know it's a God call. Because God always calls us to what is more than us. What's beyond us? That's why you have to raise mentors. The biggest issue that Joshua had in the Old Testament was he didn't raise up a Joshua. I'm not getting on Joshua, y'all. That's how I was going, well, you're in trouble. No, different Joshua. Moses raised up a Joshua. He raised up a successor. He trained him, he taught him, he allowed him to be in the presence of God. But you never read where Joshua raised up a successor. And I'm telling you, because of that, if you read the Bible, Israel went into the worst stage of its history. The Bible says a couple of times, and they, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. They did not follow the laws of God. They did what was right in their own eyes. Why? Because there was no one raised up to be the leader they should be. That's why ministries crumble. That's why movements fail. Because we neglect the thing that is most important, our exit strategy. What are we going to do? And who are we going to leave in charge? If we act like the world and we refuse to raise up somebody that can take our place because we're afraid they'll take our place, shame on it. Now, this is God's ministry, not ours. 
I look at our young people, and I'm being so honest with y'all. I look, and in the next 15 years, somebody is going to take my place. I'm going to train them for five years. I am going to pour into them. And then after that, T, me and you are going to stand and sit on the front row. And we're going to cheer them on, baby. We're going to holler, preach it! They're going to ask me, could you please not be so loud, Pastor? I want, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to cheerlead them on because they're going to take this church to the next building. See, some of y'all remember the old white building. You went to church there. You remember the brick building. You went to church there. You were part of building this church, and you've been to church here, and will be part of building the next church. But then it's going to take that next generation to build the next that's going to go further and deeper into our community, that's going to get a hold of the roots of Terrebonne Parish and shake the devil out of it. I believe that God is raising up a work that will be the greatest work they've ever known in this parish. It will be the biggest church. It will be the most power coming out of this that we will influence the state and the nation with the people that grow up and raise up out of this ministry and go forth into ministry. Who would have thought that we'd have a sitting state senator come into our church? <laughs> Representatives who are, who are close enough to us that we can speak to them and know what's going on. That God would raise missionaries and evangelists and pastors and apostles and prophets right here in this church that are going to shake the foundations of hell. Who would have thought that Bayou Blue would be packing a church in Vidalia, Louisiana that's successful and way bigger than we were when we started? Two prison churches that we're in charge of. Who would have thought that, that we would be building churches in, in Africa, India, Mexico? Who would, have, who would have thought? God thought. God called. We cast vision, and then we didn't sit back and wait for somebody else to do it. We got a hold to it, and we went forward. I believe that what Sister Janet was talking about, this shifting, the shifting that we're talking about, it, it, it's not the leadership, it's the church. There's a shifting that has to take place that people in the body of Christ have got to step into their place. God's going to raise up leaders. Our School of Urban Missions is, is handmade to raise up leaders. It's a, tough, it's a tough program. They're challenged and pushed. Ministry's drawn out of them. It's, it's a tough row, especially this trimester here because they're getting ready for Mardi Gras, so it's weekends and school and work. It's a lot. But you know what? When you get into ministry and it's 24-7, 365, when there's not somebody else to go because you're the only one there, you're going to think, you know what? I was trained for this. I'm okay because I don't do this in my strength. I do it in God's. But we're raising up leaders to send them out. One of the most difficult things there is to do in ministry is raise up great leaders and let them go. But if we don't do that, we can't reach the world with the gospel. We have the general superintendent of Kenya is coming to our church in April. I think about that, the favor of God, that we have the general superintendent of all of the assemblies of God for all of Kenya is going to sit in our church. He's going to worship with us and he's going to speak to us. He doesn't need an interpreter. He speaks English better than I do. It's the truth. God has given us the favor that when we go back to Africa this summer, that we're bringing with us Alan Griffin and his family to minister with us. John Smith and his family and, and Elizabeth. Sean and Amy. There's a dist the district superintendent of Southern Missouri districts going. We have leaders that are going with us to do pastor's conferences. They're going to do women's conferences. We're going to do street crusades. 
God, we're going to go there and we're going to bring them Jesus and we're going to run every devil we can to Tanzania. We're going to run them out of Kenya. But none of this, some of y'all that are here, y'all elected me pastor 27 years ago. And in all honesty, would we, were we thinking then that we build churches around the world? That we would raise missionaries out of our church that would go? That we would have a Bible college in our church? That we would have what we have? It's cost us a lot. Like we said, we've lost our sons and daughters in the process. Not because God wasn't here, but because the devil is just ruthless and evil. And this world has so many bells and whistles. But y'all, God's greater. My God calls into the dark places. You know, Jonathan, I, I was raised in church like you, and my mom, my mom and dad were pastors. And boy, I tell you what, I got so angry and so let down by church and God, and I went to a dark place. But you know, his voice met me there. When I thought I was doing my own thing, making my own choice, I didn't know that God was curving me around. He walked me right back up to where he needed me to be. And he took all those things that the devil meant to destroy me with, and he caused them to be strengths in my life. You know, Kent, you took a little detour, but you're on target to be the man God wants you to be. To take those steps and those chances. And every day that God pours into you, this fire begins to burn in you. I'm so excited about the man that God sent to us and what God's going to do in your life. Because I know you're on a journey, you know? Man, I wish you were perfect like me. <laughs> it's a joke, it's a joke. You have a heart for God. And there's no limit to what God can do with that. I see that. I see what God's doing, and, and I see the, the plans of God. And you know, God's greater than you can imagine. Our young people that are involved in, in, in the School of Urban Missions, they can only briefly grasp the things they might have. But y'all, there is a world that's waiting. But here's the deal. You have to take that step. You hear from God. You get a word from God. Now what are you going to do about it? You have two choices. You can sit on it and do nothing. Or you can say, okay, God, I receive that word. I know what you spoke to me. God, I'm going to do something with it. I came a place in my life I couldn't ignore the words anymore. God gave me several things in my life he's put in my heart, things, some that I've seen happen already and other things that I've not seen happen. God has opened up doors for me that I never would have imagined ever that God would connect me to places. And I believe that God connected me still to places to accomplish what he's called me to do. And you know, I need this church. I need everybody that's in here to be a part of that. I'm, I'm, I have no delusions of grandeur. I'm not going to do any great thing. God's going to do all the work. I'm just going to be his vessel. I'm going to be a vehicle he can use to get there because God's got a plan. One idea, one idea can mean the difference between great and good. Right? One idea. Our thrift store was a great idea. It was a tough because it was in a bad economy. Right? I'm going to tell you, Here's the leadership that we have. Brother Ryan serves on our board. He's one of our uh, board members. He's our youth pastor. He's been in our ministry since he's about 13, 14 years old. He said, you know, pastor, I weighed out all the things, looked at it, and I thought, well, it don't make no sense to me. But you know what? If it's a burden God gave you, I trust you. I'm going to stand along with you. 
Then he told me later. I thought it was going to be awful. He said, but I trusted you. You're my pastor. And I trusted you. I weighed out the worst that could happen, the best that could happen, and thought, well, and we talk about it. And last year, I think it was $125,000. I think it's what it was. Came through the thrift store last year. Opened two days a week. All volunteer. Y'all, that's God. That's God. That made missions a greater accomplishment than we could do without it. What one idea has God put in your heart? It's not about you, but about the kingdom. We're not, none of us going to get rich with the thrift store because that money goes into the church. Talk to other pastors. Well, how much do y'all keep to put back in the church? I said, not a penny. It's a missions possible thrift store. Not a buy you blue extra money thrift store. And God's honored that. But y'all, I believe that there are ideas of ministry that have yet to be done because we've not allowed ourselves to trust God to do it. Amen? Every head bow, every eyes closed. If our prayer team wants to come, you can come now. We're going to get ready to call people up. But, but if you're here, you say, Pastor, I know that I have a word from God and I haven't been doing anything with it. I'm just not really sure what, what to do with it. But I want God, if He'll take me, if God will take me now with this, I'm willing to let Him use me however He chooses. If that's you, just slip your hand up. Amen, I thank you. I see the hands. Anybody say, yes, Pastor, that's me. I want to do whatever God wants me to do. Anybody else? Yes, thank you. ask you to stand your feet all across the building. Father, you saw the hands that were raised, and God, you know the heart. I ask that, Lord God, you would just stir inside of us that, God, we would be everything that you have called us to be. Father God, we just push away every hindrance. And we ask that, Lord God, you would use us, pour through us, touch us, that, God, we would break down the stronghold of hell and we would become what you called us to be. I ask it in Jesus' name. If you need prayer, I want you to come. Let us pray with you and agree with you that God's going to do what he promised.